the point of the scientific method is to create a hypothesis. I'm guessing that, hey, this is, this is about to happen, okay? Then you run through the experiments, and then you run the experiments again, and then you run the experiments again, and you collect the data, and you see where it points, and, right? and then you're like, okay, hey, what was my hypothesis proven true or not? Right now, in society, we are stopping at hypothesis. Mm. We are stopping right there. So whatever I think is true, I'm never going to test it. I'm never going to go through the experience. I'm never going to collect data. I'm never going to, I'm not going to challenge that hypothesis to prove whether it's true or not. So y'all imagine if that continues the trend and that now goes into other areas in society, like medicine. Imagine if like, oh no, no, no. I feel like uh, I feel like putting um, this amount of uh, lithium into this medication is right. Well, we go into the scientific method to like prove that it's right or wrong, and it goes through FDA tests to make sure that okay. It's no, healthy. no, no, no. This is what I believe. No, no, no. I believe that this is true, and you can't tell me otherwise. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to start selling it. Like again, imagine that. But we are we as a society we create this hypothesis in our head and we stop right there. I don't know about you, Tyler, but I have received more messages, both through social media, text messages, comments in person, about last week's episode than I think any other episode we've done. Have you gotten in, or is that just me? None of my friends know that I do a podcast, <laughs> uh, or know that I have social media, so. Yeah. It yeah. hasn't, hasn't been a ton. Hasn't been a ton. I have, you know, a, a handful have come through um, our Instagram page yeah. and, and, you know, we've reposted that. But, like, yeah. um, and the episode we're talking about is we started last week a study of the book. It's called The Coddling of the American Mind How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. And if you didn't listen to last week's episode, mm -hmm. go back and listen to it. Yeah. That sets up what we're going to talk about today. Yep. This is a four part series. Last week was episode one, uh, which we talked about um, just a couple of different concepts from the book. But yeah, it, in fact, we had a listener DM us and say they're going to go through this book in their church group. Yeah. Of all things. Huh. So yeah, this, this, this book has struck a nerve with so people. It's, so it's wild. Um, so since, since I started reading it, literally two out of four conversations I have whether it's with clients, whether it's with friends, like are going through something that this book directly addresses. Yeah. And I have, and I've already like referred this book out to like eight people. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the book guy like, right. oh, hey, you gotta read yeah. this book, it's the best book ever. And literally, and a couple of them have started like, bro, like the yeah. start of this is like. I've told it's, everybody that's exactly. I don't, yeah. know if, I don't know if Jonathan Hyatt and Greg Lukanoff have some sort of affiliate payment they can they can do referral program referral program yep. but i think we'd be we'd be rich right now because yep. I, i'm saying i tell everybody about this book yeah i'm the biggest disciple of this book and uh again last week we talked about uh the concept of the three great untruths mm -hmm. that this book talks about that have seemed to spread widely in recent years number one the untruth of fragility what doesn't kill you makes you weaker number two the untruth of emotional reasoning always trust your feelings number three the untruth of us versus them Life is a battle between good and evil people. We talked about the nine common cognitive distortions. Yeah. Those were emotional reasoning, catastrophizing, overgeneralizing, dichotomous thinking, mind reading, labeling, negative filtering, dis discounting positives, and blaming. <laughs> and again, I want to reiterate, this book was written in 2018. <laughs> so four years ago. But every single concept he talks about could be it's never it's been more, more prevalent. True. It's, it's more, more true, true today than it was, right. I think, in 18. Exactly. Yeah. It's more true about what we've gone through the last few years yeah. than, uh, than even in 2018. You know what's, what, what has shocked me? And so uh, these authors are professors and uh, attorneys. And it, it, so, they, so they relate a lot to college campuses, right? Because 
I do believe what we're seeing on college campuses are foresight for what our community looks 10 to 15 years later, right? When they get into influential positions. And so just some of the things that they talked about surprised me, like the whole cancel, cancel culture of, of speakers that don't align. Yeah, we're going to talk about that today. Yeah. yeah I mean, in fact, that's me our first opening. There's, there's yeah. just so much stuff to me that I didn't think, like, I don't think about college much anymore, mm -hmm. but, like, how much, um, how much that's a precursor to what's to come. Yeah. And it depends on your university, obviously, as well. I, the it, university I went to, I don't remember there ever being issues with speakers coming on camp. Not, I bet if you went back now, I, I, I bet you would see more of it. Probably so. I mean, think about it. I mean, you were there. You were there 12, yeah. 14 years ago. Yeah, don't don't remind me I know. how old I am. I know, bro. I'm <laughs> in my twenty year high school reunion. But yeah, year. and that's what the book talks about. Really, they said this started all changed in 2013. So you yeah. and I had both been yep. gone from school for a couple of years at that point. Yep. But you're right. It's started in college, but now it's bleeding into society because those kids are now graduating and moving on. So the point of this entire book is not to bitch and moan about yeah, no. how terrible society is. It's what can Tyler and I do as parents in our own homes? What can you do as listeners in your own homes to turn the tide? That's right. To start raising kids that are going to be, as they phrase it, anti-fragile. They don't grow up in a culture of safetyism. Mm -hmm. Today we're going to talk about an old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. The idea that has caught on the last few years, that, and he opens this section up with, Words are violence. Violence is safety. And so from the book, and, and again, I, I say this every time, every time we do a book review, we're going to do a lot of reading today, but it doesn't replace, we're not trying to replace you yeah. from doing your own research and That's reading right. the book yourself. This book is so valuable, we can't possibly go through every single point. But we're going to do a lot of reading from the book because they say it better than we do. Yeah. But it doesn't mean we're reading everything. So go get the book yourself. So from the book, it says, in just the last few years, the word violence has expanded on campus and in some radical political communities beyond campus to cover a multitude of nonviolent actions, including speech that, is that this political faction claims will have a negative impact on members of protected identity groups. Outside of cultures of safetyism, the word violence refers to physical safety or physical violence. Now that some students, professors, and activists are labeling their opponents' words as violence, they give themselves permission to engage in ideologically motivated physical violence. This talks yeah. about what you were just talking about. This is not an uncommon view on many campuses. Almost one in five students surveyed in a 2017 Brookings Institution study agreed that using violence to prevent a speaker from speaking was sometimes acceptable. Findings in a second study by McLaughlin and Associates were similar. 30% of undergraduate students surveyed agreed with this statement quote if someone is using hate speech or making racially charged comments physical violence can be justified to prevent this person from espousing their hateful views end quote if that sounds reasonable to you just think about what the statement implies after concept creep and emotional reasoning expand the meaning of hate speech and racially charged in a call-out culture almost anything that is interpreted by anyone as having a negative impact on vulnerable members of the community, regardless of intent, can be called hate speech. The Columbia University linguist John McWhorter describes how the term white supremacist is now used in an utterly athletic, recreational way as a battering ram to attack anyone who departs from the party line. McWhorter himself, who is an African American, has been called a white supremacist for questioning received wisdom on matters related to race. But if some students now think it's okay to punch a fascist or white supremacist, and if anyone who disagrees with them can be labeled a fascist or white supremacist, well, you can see how the rhetorical move might make people hesitant to voice dissenting views mm -hmm. on campus. Yep. So the point there is, we've bastardized these words so far and we've watered them down so far that anything can be interpreted as racism, yep. bigotry, sexism. That's how we now justify getting violent to try to prevent somebody to come and speak because their words are violent, their words hurt me, so I'm going to stop them, I'm going to oppose them. Yeah, 
Yeah, your your words are going to emotionally make me feel unsafe. Therefore, they're violent, mm -hmm. and I am justified because I, because your words um, are contrary to my beliefs. I then feel unsafe, and now I'm justified in retaliation. Which, again, it's backwards. It's like backwards. what? So because you don't agree with an idea and they're verbalizing it then and you feel unsafe emotionally mm -hmm. you are now justified physically in making them unsafe right again it's it, it's it's a logical thing that, that i just i just don't understand but one of the things there and you may be getting into this is you said a word in there that's really important is intent mm -hmm. and i don't know if you if you have that highlighted to get through one of the biggest things um in all this is intent, right? If you look at if you look at a criminal, if you look at a criminal case here, and he uses this example in the book, if my intent was to kill my wife, and and I tried to poison her, um, but she didn't die, I would be charged as attempted. Murder, right? Right. Right. In the legal system, right? That's what it is. The intent is important, <coughs> right? But now, if... Whereas if you undercooked right. something... That's what I'm saying. It's like, okay, say my wife has a, uh, an almond allergy. It's not right. serious. But let's just say she was super, super allergic to almonds, right? And I, and I ate some almonds and kissed her, and she had a reaction and passed away. Like, the intent was not to do that. Like... Yeah. The result it, was, was the same. an accident. The result was worse. The result was worse, but the intent was the different. The intent is the difference. Right. The hundred percent. Well, the idea of intent in that definition has been whether or not, and, and there's maybe another definition, whether or not intent was to hurt somebody, you are hurting somebody yep. and you are guilty of it. So for example, like if someone says something like uh, they, 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 they use this in the book and it said uh, an email was sent because a, um, a Hispanic uh, student wrote an article, felt like, hey, I, I feel like I'm marginalized. I'm only here because of my race and I don't feel like I'm valued. It's all white professors. I feel like I'm the token Mexican person mm -hmm. here and this, da, da, da. Well, the, the dean writes an email responding mm -hmm. to her directly. Mm -hmm. With empathy, like, I am so sorry that you feel that way. I'm sorry. Like, I would love to sit down and I would love to have a conversation and I would love to talk to you about it so that you don't feel, what did she say? It was like bucket or uh, what did she say? Yeah, to, to make you not feel like you're not one of our... Um Fit our Typical, mold. Yeah, fit, fit our, our mold. mold. Yep. Fit our, so, that because, so that you don't feel like you don't fit our mold. Here we go. Here, here's the... This is from the previous chapter, but... Here, here, was the, here was the professor's response to yes. what Tyler just said. Olivia, thank you for writing and sharing this article with me. We have a lot to do as a college and community. Would you be willing to talk with me sometime about these issues? They are important to me and the dean of students staff, and we are working on how we can better serve students, especially those who don't fit our CMC mold. So the intent there was to have a productive, effective, empathetic conversation to find a solution so that they don't feel the way that they do. Mm -hmm. The intent was that. Yep. But she heard that don't fit our mold. And the she, way she read it the was... Only, yep. The only thing she grabbed onto in that entire thing, and that ultimately led to that dean resigning because of the abuse, mm -hmm. the... Um, just the, the verbal assaults that they got, the protests... I mean, all the things that came with that. She now lost her job because of that one word. Right. Because someone felt attacked. They felt unsafe. And, and that's the point of this book. And that's the point of why we wanted to discuss it, is how we can raise our children to not interpret things in that way. Or, or look, but, yeah, I, but, look, I'm hurt. I'm hurt by that. Like, I, what do you, when you say that don't fit our mold, I don't react positively to that. Like, that doesn't make, that doesn't make me feel like... Right wanting to come and, and have a conversation yeah. with you. But also parents preparing your kids that there's people that believe different things. Mm -hmm. And because they believe different things, that's not a physical assault on you. Yeah. 
Well, put yourself in that girl's situation for a yeah. second. Yeah. And I forget the psychological term for it, but you know when you get a – like let's say you got a brand new car, mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden you see that car all over the road. You never noticed it before, but now yeah. you notice it everywhere. Yeah. Because it's – I wish I remember the term. That's what I think happened in this scenario, and that's what is growing more and more is – I've experienced certain situations in my life. Now yeah. it's trained me to mm -hmm. see that scenario in everything. And in everything yeah. that I, every, that's the lens I see everything through. Yeah, that's the lens. But that's the lens because, because you let that, um, you let that be a, um, an earth shattering event to you. That's the point is how do we get, how do we change the culture of seeing individual mm. events and not letting those bleed into now we're emotional creatures so it's going to take some work and effort yeah. but my point is we're doing that a lot now and i'm guilty of this too we're painting broad brushes we're starting to see scenarios that have nothing to do this is why race the word term racism has become watered down because people who have had racist in actions against them yeah have the tendency now they're they're that's ratcheted up in them now yeah. to now start to see it everywhere yeah and i get it and, and i want to be empathetic to that but i think the point is there was no racist or bad intent yeah from that professor's perspective yeah, yeah. but the student read it yep in that way and yep. that's the whole point yeah is how can we raise a generation that don't read it that way to be able to think or, critically again i don't think if you read it that way but then but being able to have the mental fortitude toughness resilience to say okay, that sucks me, but yeah, yeah. Even no, if, you're right. You're even right. if it even if it was a even if it right. was like yeah, you right. people or whatever right like one of those things you're like whoa 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 but to say like Okay, the entire email was drafted about finding a solution here, and there was something that was thrown in there. You know what? Like, I don't have time for that. Like, yeah. I don't have time for that negativity in my life. I'm just going to, you know what? I'm going to move on, yeah. and I'm going to go I'm gonna go do me. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. Like, if somebody upsets us a little bit because our parents never said <laughs> no to us, and we've, we have reaffirmed and revalidated whatever beliefs we have, and we've never been challenged, mm -hmm. when somebody does stop everything and you have to pay because like i yeah i feel attacked well there was another cool story it was a it was a, a african-american lady who was married to a, a white, white man yeah. yes. a white male yep he was having some heart issues she rushed him to the and again we're not gonna go through the story but she rushed him to the hospital and the way the nurses and doctors interacted with her she felt in the moment yeah was racist was disrespectful because yep. they treat her as less than they didn't view oh my a black woman and a white right, man right like that they only they, they tried to address him only they wouldn't speak to her so this is all going through her mind in real time but what she's able to do in that moment when i thought was really cool was she was able to detach from the emotion of the situation uh -huh. realize everybody's under stress here yeah and what she did was she had a conversation she said this is after. the way that made me feel afterward after, after. everything is calm, yeah. calm, calm down she said, hey, this is the way this made me feel. Just be mindful. And the, the doctors and nurses, I'm so sorry, had no idea. Yeah. There was no intention behind it. Yeah. But she was mature enough yeah. in that scenario yes. to not throw a big fit, not throw a big stink, and, she and have a lo that logical the, conversation with the, with the Exactly. People. In the moment, recognized it to say, okay, I'm offended by this. Like, it's getting really frustrating now, like, to the point where I want to cry. But me overreact not overreacting me reacting to this scenario how is this going to help my husband how is this going to help them do their jobs mm -hmm. it's not so i'm okay i'm going to take it back and then i'm going to go have a conversation after the fact and i'm going to address it like because it did it did it did hurt me mm -hmm. but i mean just the the awareness of that like we need more of that yeah more yeah it. and there's obviously the racism part we just don't have that perspective personally personal right. experience with it right but we can take this to a lot of different aspects oh, right yeah if somebody you know my big thing growing up was uh body like dysmorphia yeah issues with the way i looked the reality is nobody gave a damn about the way i looked right. besides me yeah 
but I interpreted every swim party, yeah. every that's scenario that. where my shirt had to come off. I interpreted that as everybody's judging me. That's that mind reading thing. Right. Yeah. The reality is nobody was, nobody cared, thought twice about the way I looked, nope. but I had played it up so much in my head yeah. that this was an issue that it hindered me for a long time. And so I think there's all these different scenarios that a stronger, more resilient, more logical person. Now, again, at 14, that's hard, <laughs> that's hard right. to get in. Right. But a logical person steps back and realizes, hey, dude, nobody cares. You are just fine. Yeah. Show them big old man titties off. Nobody cares. Hey, they're looking at your puka <laughs> shells anyways. Yeah. They're distracted by my puka shells and my bowl cut. <laughs> That's what I should have realized. That's what I'm saying. I was throwing them off my, there's, my undercut. There's, there's no way Dude, that they were looking at my muffin not top. Only did I 100%. Have a, not to go off on a tangent. Not only did I have a, a bowl cut. Yeah. I had, I don't know if you've ever seen this before. I've heard it. Somehow they were, my aunt cut my hair growing yeah. up. And we all had the same hair. All my cousins, yeah. everybody. Somehow she was able to lift our hair and undercut, like call it an undercut. Oh, bro. <laughs> underneath. Bro, so the, I had, oh, it was, I had so the, the hair cut. falls over. It was here, <laughs> but I shaved it up to here. Yes. It was shaved all the way up to yes. here. Yes. Oh, dude, there yes. was a period, I think like fifth grade. <laughs> Fifth grade, and, I, and it's like kind of come back, I guess, a little bit where they'll do like the little pony, and it's like right. it's just yeah. this much hair, right? Yeah. And I had that because I'd shaved it up. It was a skater cut, is what it yes. what it was, right? Yep. It, but same deal, it was shaved all the way up, but then it would hang down. Oh, flat. I thought I was the only one. Oh, no, bro. <laughs> one time I, I even was got like, uh, coast to coast. <laughs> one time I even had her put a lightning bolt. This was before it was cool to do a lightning bolt, <laughs> and <laughs> she took a red sharpie and outlined. No. The lightning bolt. I don't know why. I don't was remember it why. Red? Was your school colors red? Maybe. I don't remember. But. <laughs> you don't remember what your school colors are. Oh, yeah. My lunch was, yeah. We were red and, uh, yeah. red and gray. Yeah. Yeah. Hurrah for the Taylor Trojans. Badass. Hurrah for the red and gray. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we got there. I think the point is when you start to see things through that lens, now everything looks like. Yeah. And like you said, intent matters. Intent matters. So if there's truly no harm being done by their words, it's possible for me to shrug it off and move on. Yeah. yeah. Like I don't have to react to every little thing that's been said. Yeah. And then like he says, whenever that leads to physical violence, because you're now expanding the meaning and definition of words. Yeah. That's where we start to see well, a lot of these issues. And that's, I'm sure you're going to get to the idea of trauma. I want to take a quick break and thank our partners, Sleep Number, and highlight a couple of things they're doing. Guys, these Sleep Number beds are unreal. The technology that they've created, the feedback that it gives you on your sleep. I've got the app opened up right here. They tell you things like your heart rate, your heart rate variability, your breathing rate, all these type uh, metrics and feedback to give you so that you can improve your quality of sleep. They're all over the place. You can go and check yourself out at Sleep Number Store, wherever you live. Go to sleepnumber.com as well. They've got great resources on there. We just talked about this not too long ago. They have a whole blog section, all these articles, things that you can improve your health. Sleep Number is definitely changing the game when it comes to bedding. So get yourself to Sleep Number, get yourself to sleepnumber.com and check them out. Now back to the episode. Right. All right, it's like, that's, that's one thing he addresses, and trauma for however long the word has existed related to physical, something that, something that has happened to somebody that is outside of the ability for a human to process, like mm -hmm. physically or emotionally. So like war, rape, like things that are terrible that do not happen normally. Like, and so... Now, and are you going to get to that before I, before I, uh, I honestly don't remember. Okay. All right. Well, if we do, <laughs> we'll get there. I don't remember where that part falls into the, but, the section, but, but essentially, like you said, we're, we're changing the definition of words to make, to accommodate our sensitivity and lack of resilience. So the idea of trauma is like the PTSD, like, like the veterans that served in Vietnam, the things they saw, the things they experienced, the, the wounds that they had, like legitimate PTSD. We're now saying that you get PTSD if your dog dies. Yeah. Like what, what are you talking about? Yeah. We've again, bastardized the term because, because PTSD. again, because traumatic trauma has to do with things outside of the human norm. Mm -hmm. Death always happens. Div I mean, 
divorce, it happens. Those are normal things. Losing a friend. Um, I'm trying to think of like other things that like getting fired. Like those are normal within the human they scope. They suck, but they're they, normal. Not saying, they, yeah. not saying you don't need counseling. Not saying you don't need that. But now that we're labeling those and diagnosing and treating and medicating for post-traumatic stress disorder because of those things that are that every single human goes through or will go through in their life, and now we're saying we're unique and mm -hmm. this is it. But and again, like, my dog died. Yeah, guess what? If you're lucky, you get, you get 12 years of them. Right. Every single dog dies. Everybody that has owned a dog most of the time, yeah, will die. Their, their dog will die. So, like, again, we're changing this because of our lack of just overall yeah. mental fortitude. Yeah, and, and that's what he goes into next is, why is this such a bad idea to tell students that words are violence? So from the book, he says, in a widely, in a widely circulated essay in the New York Times in July 2017, the argument that words can be violence was made by Lisa Feldman Barrett a well-respected professor of psychology and emotion researcher at Northwestern University. Barrett offered this sol syllogism. All right, guys, I'm a moron. Yeah. How do you say S-Y-L-L-O-G-I-S-M? Syllogism? I've never heard I've that I've never word. heard that word. Yeah. Have you heard that word? Is that how you say it, Will? You don't know either? Yeah, look it up. <laughs> syllogism? Yet again, this Yale professor... <laughs> says a word that I don't know. She uses this big word. <laughs> so if you're a, a linguist yeah. and I'm a moron and that's not how you say it, I apologize, but I'm going to continue on because it comes up here again. Is the only reason I'm making a big deal out of it. Barrett offered this syllogism. That can't be right, by the way. <laughs> J. Ah, syllogism. Okay. Okay. All right. Should I start over? No. <laughs> Syllogism. <laughs> Syllogism. Dude, we're such, I'm such an idiot. <laughs> Barrett offered this syllogism. <laughs> Just go, bro. <laughs> You're making it worse. Uh, okay. If words can cause... <laughs> if words... You want me to read? <laughs> no, I'll be all right. <laughs> I went back to my 11-year-old self syllogism. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> We might not get through this episode, y'all, because now I'm mad about it. <laughs> we're trying to be, like, emotionally mature. That's what we're preaching. You shouldn't have corrected me. And we're, you and shouldn't have told me Out of that super complicated word, now we're focused on four letters. <laughs> uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, have your parents explain it. Oh. <laughs> All right, back to it. I'm not, I can't say it again. If words can cause stress, and if prolonged stress can cause physical harm, then it seems that speech at certain types, of, at least certain types of speech, can be a form of violence. It is a logical error to accept the claim that harm, even physical harm, is the same as violence. Barrett's, I'm going to skip the word, takes the form that if A can cause B, and B can cause C, then A can cause C. Therefore, if words can cause stress and stress can cause harm, then words can cause harm. But that does not establish that words are violence. It only establishes that words can result in harm, even physical harm, which we don't doubt. To see the difference, just rerun the syllogism by swapping in breaking up with your girlfriend or giving students a lot of homework. Both of these can provoke stress in someone else, including elevated levels of cortisol, and stress can cause harm, so both can cause harm. That doesn't mean they're violent acts. Yeah. I'm going to take a break here. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> the fact that words are violence. Um, I, I think, so I'm on the fence because I've, I've heard speak, I've heard people speak that I'm like, okay, that's like, it's a, it's a violent tone. It's... It's promoting violence, but like to to physically react to words as if it's the same as someone stabbing you or punching you is is to me I don't comprehend. Yeah. I don't get that. I don't understand that. There is a word I know. It's asinine. 
I, I was I was gonna say that, but uh, then I figured you get stuck on the first three letters, and then we yeah. then we lose ass. Then we lose another five minutes. <laughs> so what do we do about it? Yeah, here's here's a good here's some good. He can say it better than us. Here's some good advice. If you keep the distinction, this distinction. Yes. If you keep the distinction between speech and violence clear in your mind, then many more options are available to you. So if you're able to separate the two. Now, all of a sudden, a whole world of options are open to you. First, this one's crazy. You can take the stoic response and develop your ability to remain unmoved. As Marcus Aurelius advised, choose not to be harmed and you won't feel harmed. Don't feel harmed and you haven't been. The more ways your identity can be threatened by casual daily interactions, the more valuable it will be to cultivate the stoic ability to not be emotionally reactive to not let others control your mind and your cortisol levels the stoics understood that words don't cause stress directly they can only provoke stress and suffering in a person who has interpreted those words as posing a threat you can pick your battles devote your efforts to changing policy policies that matter to you and make your make yourself immune to trolls I know I stuttered through a lot of that, but no, 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 that's, but that's a great point. So you don't good. have to oh be gosh. moved by somebody else's words. And guess what? Here, well, first of all, if someone is not speaking directly to you, right? If they're just speaking generalization, like they talk about in the book, speakers. Like, I'm not saying, Ben, you're a terrible person. You're out of shape. You don't squat very much, whatever, whatever gets to you, right? Dude, but if you start talking about my squat. That's what I'm saying. I knew I know how to I know how to hit your core. But if someone is saying, like, hey, you know, here is evolution theory, or here is how the universe was created, or something like that, has nothing directly like associated with you, but it conflicts with your beliefs. Like you're telling me that you're going to let that raise your cortisol levels, get you upset, and you're gonna now, you're gonna allow someone's words to affect your day. Mm -hmm. Like I've taken the approach, and this is one thing, like I feel like I used to, um, because I was such a people pleaser, right? So if someone even said something direct, if something said, someone said something directly to me, like sometimes it would affect me, like and it'd be like, oh crap, like I don't like me. Or like I let them down. And how old are you when this is going on? This is probably up through uh, up through college. Yeah, I, I let that stuff. I really, really cared about like what what they. But it was it was less about me feeling attacked and more about me not wanting to disappoint them. But either way, is I, I got to a point where it was like, I, I can't let you ruin my day. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not gonna let you have that much control over me. What was the switch for you? I don't know. I, I think. Um, I think, was it word like did somebody guide you through this or did you come to the realization yourself? On, I think part of it was my faith because it was like I cared less about like because I'm like I recognize okay look I'm 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 planning for eternity here I'm not planning for I'm not planning for this week yeah and so I think that perspective was part of a shift and then uh, and then some of it was just honestly maturity and then learning and then realizing and and actually like looking inward and recognizing that like okay why am I upset like. Okay, for example, it happened in a negotiation. Like, I was negotiating a lease, and um, I was lied to through the process, but then it got combative, and it literally, for like two weeks, I was angry, I was mad, and then I'm sitting there one afternoon, and I'm like, I'm, I'm heated, because I just gotten off a call with, with um, the other side, and I'm like, what am I, like, it's affected my time with my kids. It's affected my wife. Why am I going to let those words affect me? And those words like directly impacted my income. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm like, man, why am I going to let somebody have that much impact over me? Yeah. Like I can control my mood for the most part. I can control my surroundings. Like what I can control. That's the only thing I can control. I can't control what he says. I can't control how he feels or believes or acts or things that he doesn't do or things that he's dishonest about, I can control me. And so that, that idea of stoicism and taking it and just being like, all right, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to let you have that effect and impact on me.
And I think that comes with time, right? You're 37 yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. You have a maturity about you. Your brain is literally fully formed. So the question is, because I think the main point is raising our kids in a certain yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. So how are we going to Just, I think take that same maturity mm -hmm. and implement it into our 11, 12-year-olds? I think it's, 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 it's teaching moments, right? right? It's times where you can, with kids, right, is you, you've got to show action and result, right? You've got to say, okay, hey, because of this, our, our, our uh, action, reaction, result. Like, and, and if they can physically see it, because it's hard to get my 10-year-old, who's brilliant, let me, let me use my eight-year-old. My eight-year-old to like understand just ideas and concepts, what's, right? What's wrong with your eight-year-old? <laughs> it, it's a more appropriate <laughs> example. <laughs> so it, 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 for him, it's hard for him just like concepts because his eyes roll back in his head and he stops mm -hmm. listening. Right. Um, whereas if he can actually tangibly see the impact and effect, like the cause and effect, then he's like, okay, now it registers a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like, okay, in these moments as we're parenting, okay, hey, look, I'm going to encourage this. I'm going to encourage you to try to react this way as best as possible. Okay, now let's look at the outcome on the other side and then call back and then, and then actually go ahead and reflect on it together and talk about it. Okay, hey, what happened last time? I did this. Okay, cool. Now, what happened this time? Okay, which result did you like better? Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. Okay, so see why there's a difference and why mommy and daddy are trying to get you to understand this. And it, but it, but it can't be what I what I make a um, I make the mistake of a lot. And back to my eight year old is we'll get in a car and I go on a thirty minute rant hmm. about like what he needs to he needs to understand or how he needs to not behave that way or whatever. And and literally I'll like get to the end of the conversation and, and it. And it's like, what I'm talking about, the stoicism, I'm like, I'm like, okay, what did I just say? I don't remember. Like, what do you mean you don't remember? We literally just talked about it. What did I just say? I don't remember. <laughs> but in order to, for him to teach, and, and, and I, I'm generalizing children, every kid is going to be different in how, they, in how they learn things. But I really think that they tangibly have to, have to in real time, recognize, okay, hey, here is the cause, here's my reaction, and here's the result. How did, how did those differ, and how did those actions affect yeah. it? And so if you just teach them, like, listen, I know your friends, they said something mean at school today. That's not nice. I'm really sorry you feel that way. I know that that hurt your feelings. Um, let's think about it this way. Let's try to think about it this way, and then let's talk about it again tomorrow. And then come back and visit. That's a, that's a great approach. And that takes a couple of things. That takes relationship. Yep. It takes knowing your child. Because like you said, you didn't even use your 10-year-old as an example <laughs> because clearly she's a different person than yep. your 8-year-old. Yes. So that takes, and that's the point. That takes, that's going to take effort to know yeah. your kids differently. Yep. It's going to take relationship to know to, to, that you can have those open discussions. Yep. Back to the book, he says, it's not fair. But even as we work to lessen hatred and heal divisions, all of us must learn to ignore some of the things we see and just carry on with our day. A second and more radical response opens up when you reject the speech as violence view. You can use your opponent's ideas and arguments to make yourself stronger. The progressive activist Van Jones, who is Barack Obama's green jobs advisor, endorsed the view in February of 2017 in a conversation at the University of Chicago's Institute for Politics. When Democratic strategist David Axelrod asked Jones about how progressive students should react when people they find ideologically offensive, such as someone associated with the Trump administration, are invited to speak on campus, Jones began, There are two ideas about safe spaces. One is a very good idea and one is a terrible idea. The idea of being physically safe on campus, not being subjected to sexual harassment and physical abuse, or being targeted specifically personally for some kind of hate speech, you're an N-word or whatever, I am perfectly fine with that. But there's another view that is now, I think, ascendant, which I think is just as hor with, with I think which I think is just a horrible view, which is that I need to be safe ideologically, I need to be safe emotionally, I just need to feel good all the time. And if someone says something that I don't like, that's a problem for everybody else, including the administration. I don't want you to be safe ideologically. I don't want you to be safe emotionally. I want you to be strong. That's different. I'm not going to pave the jungle for you. Put on some boots and learn how to deal with adversity. I'm not going to take all the weights out of the gym. 
That's the whole point of the gym. This is the gym. Yeah. I thought that was a great. Perfectly yeah. said. Yeah. I don't want you to be safe ideologically. I don't want you to be safe emotionally. I want you to be strong. Yeah. And I mean, just, and I'm going to be very short with this because I think I don't want to take away from how, how well that was said. Um, but how are you ever supposed to have convictions unless your beliefs are challenged? Hmm. Like there's a difference between belief, like I believe and I'm convicted. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. For sure. So how, how are you ever supposed to get to convictions unless they're challenged, the ideologies are challenged, your thoughts are challenged, and then it is your belief then is proved over and over and over. And you're like, yeah, like I've seen it play out. I've seen it be challenged. And it still, it still comes out true. I have conviction in that, whatever it is. Like you want it to be challenged. And that's the problem with, I think our education system is we can't challenge thoughts and beliefs, no matter how wrong they are. Like we can't challenge them because you feel emotionally unsafe. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I was no, that was I, good. No, 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 no. I was gonna go. I was gonna go even further and just start berating people, but I think that's contrary <laughs> to what we're trying to accomplish here. Anyways, go You're right on. No, 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 no. You're <laughs> no, trying to get me canceled, so this is the Ben Gibbs show. <laughs> <laughs> it goes back to the, the quote. Don't prepare the road for your child. Prepare the child for the road. That's right. What's a more, um, what's a more realistic outcome that we come to some sort of utopia and everything's perfect, or that we build resilient children? Yeah. Building resilient children is probably yeah. the more realistic outcome there. And like you said, I don't want to ruin. Problem what is, said. there's people that would say, "Oh no, utopia." Oh, is utopia possible. for sure. Oh, for sure. And we, and we love those people, too. We want to have yeah. conversations and discussions yeah, with those people. Yeah, we would love. We might, we might send them to, like, Hawaii or something where they're off from the mainland, but. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding, guys. All right, I want to take a quick minute to talk about our partner, Choctaw Casino and Resort. Uh, we are really, really humbled uh, and grateful to be a partner for them. If you've listened to the show for any amount of time, uh, you've heard how great the resort is there, how great the casino is, the new expansion. They've doubled in size, 3,000 new slots. They've got unbelievable sports bar. They've got unbelievable restaurants, unbelievable movie theaters, arcades for kids. It is endless, the things that they've not only improved but added. Um, but it's just an the, the experience that they provide is second to none. Choctaw Nation has done an incredible job with the community, with philanthropy, with support. Um, they have just done incredible things. So we are extremely humbled and grateful to partner with Choctaw Casino and Resort. Make sure, I know you know it, but it's just a short drive of 75. Go check them out. And now back to the episode. Uh, and then we'll wrap up this episode with a little bit of a transition, but um, I want you to replace the word professor in this scenario with just society. Think of this, if, if the university system isn't, you know, in your mind today, if, if you don't really relate to that, just relate what we're about to talk about with society. And he talks about the loss of political diversity among professors has had three negative consequences. And again, we can, yeah. you know, echo chambers, yeah. right? The loss of Political diversity in your echo chambers yeah. can have three negative consequences. First, there's a problem that many college students have little or no exposure to professors from half of the political spectrum. Many students graduate with an inaccurate understanding of conservatives, politics, and much of the United States. Now, again, he's using a very specific example of a lot of the colleges have become left-leaning. Most professors, statistically speaking, are left-leaning. Therefore, a lot of the lessons and, and things taught are from that lens. Yeah. What I want you as a listener to think if, if college is so far removed, are you getting exposed, like you said a second ago, are you getting exposed to other ideologies, to other trains of thought, to other perspectives? If you're not, maybe you reevaluate the way you're yeah. consuming information. Yeah. If you're constantly taking in conservative opinion pages, maybe you need to start to reevaluate. Yeah, so the scientific method, all right? And, and I can't remember every single step. It's been... It's been 23 years, as I mentioned, since I took uh, intro to biology and learned the scientific method. Was that ninth grade? Ninth grade. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the, it, the point of the scientific method is to create a hypothesis. I'm guessing that, hey, this is, this is about to happen. 
Okay. Then you run through the experiments. And then you run the experiments again. And then you run the experiments again. And you collect the data. And you see where it points. And, right? and then you're like, okay, hey, what was my hypothesis proven true or not? Right now, in society, we are stopping at hypothesis. Mm. We are stopping right there. So whatever I think is true, I'm never going to test it. I'm never going to go through the experience. I'm never going to collect data. I'm, never gonna, I'm not going to challenge that hypothesis to prove whether it's true or not. So y'all, imagine if that continues the trend and that now goes into other areas in society, like medicine. Imagine if like, oh, no, 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 I feel like, uh, I feel like putting um, this amount of uh, lithium into this medication is right. Well, we go into the scientific method to like prove that it's right or wrong, and it goes through FDA tests to make sure that okay, it's no, healthy. no, no, no. This is what I believe. No, no, no. I believe that this is true, and you can't tell me otherwise. And so mm. I'm going to start selling it. Like again, imagine that. But we are we as a society we create this hypothesis in our head and we stop right there. Yeah, and that's a good analogy. I just came up with it. It was crazy. Wow. Dude, you're freaking I, I was literally, I was literally like, I was probably like three or four sentences in and I'm like, oh, dang, this is going to be How good. smart are you? It's going to be good. <laughs> I could, what I could. What did you make on the SAT? I could, I could learn these colleges. <laughs> you could be a Yale grad. Yeah, you? that's what I'm saying. It's easy. Not, no big deal. Number two, second, the loss of viewpoint diversity among the faculty means that what students learn about politically controversial topics will often be left shifted from the truth. On average, students will get closer to the truth if they are exposed to debates from credentialed scholars who approach difficult problems from differing perspectives. We're not saying there's anything inherently wrong with the increasing number of left-leaning students on campus, but we are saying that the viewpoint diversity is necessary for the development of critical thinking. While viewpoint hom homogeneity, whether on the left or the right, leaves a community vulnerable to groupthink and orthodoxy. Yeah. And also, to think about the staff and again, society, but in a university, think about the the numbers on the staff relative to the students on campus, right? It's a very small number. So that group think idea, it's a small cohort of professors relative to the students. Mm -hmm. And if they're all already thinking the same way, mm -hmm. so now that you have the viewpoint of a few of the same idea, now influencing a large number of students. Like that's, that is, that is scary mm -hmm. because they're not getting the ability to one challenge it, two hear different viewpoints, different perspectives, different experiences. It's from a few that many are just are told to adopt because that's what you have to do. And and just so you know, these guys are not conservative individuals. They would politically they would lean more left. So they're not. And as I said, they're not saying just because it's left ideology it's bad. Right. It would if the roles were reversed, same. they would be saying the exact same yeah. thing. Their point is having all one type of perspective yeah. is not where you want to be heading, yeah, whether right. it's in universities or society. Yep. And then the third problem: some academic communities, particularly those in the most progressive parts of the country, may attain such high levels of political homogen homogeneity and solidarity that they undergo a phase change, taking on properties of a collective entity that are anti th anti. That is antithesis. Cool? Yeah. How do you say that? To see. the north. Antithetical? <laughs> Antithetical. Wow. Okay. Words are hard, man. Yeah, they are. All right, let me start over. Some academic communities, particularly those in the most progressive parts of the country, may attain such high levels of political homogeneity and solidarity that they undergo a phase change, taking on properties of a collective entity that are antithetical antithetical to the normal aims of a university. A collective entity mobilized for action is more likely to enforce political orthodoxy and less likely to tolerate changes to its key ideological beliefs. Politically homogenous communities are more susceptible to witch hunts, particularly when they feel threatened from the outside. There are a lot of hard words in that statement. Yeah. But I think the point, I think what I read is that, again, just another issue of all going down. This is what leads to some of these more violent outgoing yeah. of. Well, yeah. I mean, you thoughts. look at, you look at Portland and Seattle, right. You know, during the pandemic and, and these, 
um, independent areas and the violence that were associated with it. It's just, I don't know. It's when everybody feels the same way and there's any sort of contradiction, like the immediate, the immediate reaction is violence. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, that's where, that's where it's a challenge for me when I'm, I'm watching this is if there's, if there's a protest, right? It's not the same civil disobedience that it was when like Dr. King marched. It's okay. We're going to go protest and we're going to vandalize your buildings. We're going to flip cars. We're going to burn cars. Um, we're going to attack the police. We're going to do all these things. And it's like, because you feel threatened, you feel like that's justified because you have been so sheltered from different ideologies that like, now you feel like this is an attack on you as a person. And it's, it has nothing to do with you. Yeah. Don't act like you're that important. Right. Yeah. I mean, closing thoughts, you know, is I think the take home point from this section is words are words. Yeah. They're not violence. Start to look for intent behind the words. Yep. Just because something appears one way on the surface does not necessarily mean that's the way it is. That just may be how you're interpreting mm -hmm. that statement. So raising our kids in a way where they can decipher. And again, it's going to be difficult. This is going to take a lot of effort and work to be able to raise our kids in this way. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some intention. Mm -hmm. But that's how we start to right the ship is we get them to understand that, hey, your feelings are going to get hurt from time to time. That's just part of life. That's what's going to happen. But how you, you interpret what you do with that, yeah, exactly. how you interpret what they say, what your next actions are, that's what separates yeah, you. Yeah, you can you can either let it debilitate you or you can allow it to be a source of growth, right, and maturity. And it's a choice is yours. Yep. But do you have the tools and resilience to be able to let that be a good thing mm -hmm. that your ideology is being challenged? Right. Right. And then the lastly is to exposure to different ideas. One thing I'll use an example is uh, Dallas is is very known for private schools. And I don't have anything against private schools. Uh, a ton of my friends send their kids to private schools. Um, and I think that, I mean, there's scenarios where I could see us going to private schools, but Tiffany and I are really adamant about trying to stay public as long as possible. Uh, because it's way too expensive. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but because there's different yeah. ideologies mm -hmm. that are that are in the school, sometimes it makes it a whole lot harder. Yeah, it does. It makes it a whole lot harder to raise our kids for them emotionally. Like it's hard. There's a lot harder conversations to have. But what what we're looking at is we're looking at okay, what is this going to do when our kids are 25? When they grew up and they all believe the same thing, mm -hmm. they all look the same way. They are all raised in the same income bracket-ish, mm -hmm. right? Things are just kind of like given to them. They're not really truly challenged because just the, the curriculum doesn't allow for that. Mm -hmm. Like, is that really going to help them? Maybe, maybe we're idiots. But my standpoint is, is I would much rather my children um, have to deal with more challenges, differences, their thoughts being challenged meeting different people from different races different socioeconomic levels like and having the diversity and thoughts and people in an experience and opportunity and then that is that is going to prepare them better long term right because if you're not challenged and yeah oh you're it's a more challenging curriculum okay i, I maybe um but let's let's really truly think about like what's gonna what's gonna provide more lasting benefit you understanding algebra one in eighth grade as opposed to 10th grade mm -hmm. or you having to work through a problem because of uh you know some atheist that is bullying you and you and you work through that creative relationship and empathy because you're exposed to that you're exposed to different thinking you know what i mean like yep. No, that, that's been the, and I've said it on here before, that's been my constant thought is I was fortunate to grow up in a city, I think it was like 150,000 people, which is not huge, but it's, it's not, not small. tiny. No, it's not small. And the advantage of that is everybody goes to one of two, maybe three high schools. Yeah. There's, a, there's a high school outside of town, but 
most people go to one of two high schools. Yeah. So you're exposed to all socioeconomic classes. Yeah. You're exposed to all different races. You're exposed to all different ideas. I was, my seventh grade, there was a girl that got pregnant. She had two kids by the time we were in eighth grade in middle school. Dang. Now, I don't say that as a badge of honor. I just say, like, I was exposed. To, there, was, there was kids dealing drugs and getting busted for marijuana in sixth grade. Like, doesn't mean make it a good thing. I'm just saying I was exposed from an early age to way different yeah. ways of life than what I was used to. Yeah. What I'm afraid of now, and you and I both, we live in towns just next to each other. When yeah. you get to a bigger city and you move to suburbs, what happens is these smaller towns of 20,000 become people become bubbles because yeah. you have to make a certain amount of money to live there. Yeah. Most people look very similar. Yeah. And we're all going to go to the same now our, our towns are both getting more high schools, but the point is it's the same people going to those high schools. Yeah. So our boys and girls are not going to be raised the same way you and I are raised right. from a, that standpoint. Yeah. Even if they do go to public school, it's going to be a lot of the same type of kids. So it's going to be imperative for you and I mm -hmm. to take them to different parts of the city, the big city I'm talking about, mm -hmm. the big part of Dallas, and expose them. Take them to do other countries yeah. and expose them. Yeah. Because it's going to be very – the easier play is for us to just – raise them in our little bubbles and yep. they just graduate and go off and hey, figure it out when you're 25. And it's going to take effort it's for a us. Shock. It's a shock. It's going to take effort for both you and I. And that's why sports are so great as well. It gets you in a locker room with all different, with all one common goal. Yeah. So parents, even if you do live in a scenario where most of the people around you do think like you act like you are like you, it's going to take more effort for you, unfortunately, yep. or fortunately. Yep. Whereas other cities, maybe diversity is not that big of a, it's not going to be that hard to, yeah. to, to, to expose. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the point though, is getting you thinking, getting you acting, not just talking, not just complaining, but actually, actually taking action. Yep. Actually taking action. Yep. And I think that's what this book and that's what this section teaches. Next week, we're going to talk about how did we get here? What are some of the things that led us to this point? Yeah. Really start to break down the problem um, and, and kind of why it's become a problem. So hopefully you guys have enjoyed this discussion. Hopefully you enjoyed this book it's review. Stuff. Hopefully by now, two episodes in, you've gone out and you've purchased this book and started to read it yourself and started to take away your own perspectives and actions items. Again, uh -huh. these are just what our thoughts. Take away your own ideas. Yep. Take away your own action items. Raise yep. your family how you see fit as long as it's contributing to the good of society. That's right. I think we're all on the right track. Yep. We may all go out about it a different way, but if the end result is that we're raising little humans that contribute well to society, I think we're, we're on the right path. Yep. So uh, have a great weekend, guys. Uh, we will see you next week.